Hey everyone, Anthony here, and today I'm joined by the president of Padron Cigars, George Padron. I think the, the future of the cigar industry is a good one. Um, I think that we have made significant inroads as an industry, but this is, this is a battle that doesn't end ever. This right. is a constant thing. Yeah. And uh, you know, we have to be prepared to continue to defend the industry because unfortunately, there is a lot of misunderstanding as to what this industry is really all about. So today we're gonna to talk about George's beginnings in the cigar industry, what it was like to work with his father and now his son, and of course, everything Padron Cigars. George, welcome back to Holtz. Thanks, Maz. It's nice to be here back at Holtz man, with, the, with the Levine family and with everyone else here. It was a pleasure having you. So, you know, you and I go back many years, but for our audience out there that might not know the Padron story, right? Could you give us a little bit of background, right? About your family growing up in Miami and your coming of age in the tobacco industry. Well, I mean, the, you know, the story obviously starts with my father, not with me. Um, you know, I was very fortunate to, to come in at a time when, um, you know, I, I graduated from college and um, I was deciding of where to, what to do uh, going forward after, after college and I decided to get an MBA. And uh, in the meantime, I, I was working with my father and, um, you know, it gave me an opportunity. I mean, I had always obviously grown up in the business in Miami. And I had, um, you know, been a part of all of the things that have been going on in the business, but obviously at a different level because I was only working part time in the summers. So now that I graduated, I got a chance to come in and, and be more like, you know, on a day to day basis. And I started seeing, you know, some of the challenges that we had at the time, um, you know, may, there were issues with production, you know, getting raw material because of the embargo. There was a lot of uh, things that were affecting the company at the time. I also realized that many of the consumers that we had were older consumers that uh, were mainly from Miami, and uh, I was concerned that the future of the company, you know, was com was somewhat complicated because of that, you know, the demographics of who we were selling to. And we had a great business in Miami, but we didn't really sell nationally. So then that's when I approached my father to, you know, to think about the possibility of selling at the national level and attending these trade shows and. And you know, and that's basically how it started. He, I was lucky enough that, you know, he he uh, believed in the in the in what I proposed to him, and he let me do it. And you know, little by little, we started, and here we are today. Um, you know, obviously, we've always had a great product. Uh, at least, we our focus has always been to make a great product. And now we are at a you know much higher level. We've been able to increase production. We've been able to. Um, you know, do a lot of things in the last 35, you know, 35 years, which have been great, great things for our company. But I always say that none of this would have been possible had it not been for the foundation that was laid by my father many, many years before I even came into the company. So, you know, while yes, my contributions to the company are significant and in, in, in many of the product development and all that, but that wouldn't have been possible had he not made the sacrifices that he made. So with that in mind, how early on did you know that you were destined to be in the tobacco industry? Like how early on and, and what age did you finally make that leap and jump in? Well, <clears throat> it was probably when I, it was when I graduated from, from high school, from college, that I started, I worked with my dad for a year and, uh, and then I decided that I wanted to get an MBA and I had saved up some money. So I asked him if he would help me pay for the MBA if he would pay half and I would pay the other half. And he said, yes. And then, you know, I left, I did it in a year and a half. And then I came back and then that's when I really, you know, I, I was applying for jobs and other things. And then I started thinking, you know, what am I doing here? You know, I got, I've got this business that is, you know, tr has tremendous potential. Cause I, I, I mean, I'm, you, I could see the potential, yeah. but you know, we, we had a lot of work to do. You know, there was a lot of work to do. And I knew that my dad, you know, he couldn't do it alone. So I'm like, you know what? I might as well take my chances here and just, you know, 
capitalize on all the work that he's done and help him, you know, take this thing to another level. And, uh, you know, and the rest is history. I mean, we, the timing was also good because there was a lot of things happening in Nicaragua, um, you know, which is a whole different story, you know, set of things I got to get into that story. But uh, coincidentally, when I came in, was just the end of that embargo and the opening up again of Nicaragua. So I was able to come in with him on, at the ground level in Nicaragua back in 1990, so. So how old were you? I was um, 22, huh? 23. So. So yeah, I mean, I mean, Padron is truly a family business. So what was it like working with, obviously, a legendary figure in the cigar industry like your father, Jose Orlando Padron? I mean, <clears throat> He, my dad was a super normal guy. I mean, you know, he wasn't, uh, he was not an ego guy. He was very humble, um, very simple, uh, very demanding in many ways. You know, he, he expected people to work, but he also is someone that when you gained his respect, you know, you were golden. But to get that was the hard part, you know? Sure. So, you know, for me, working with him was a tremendous thing because he busted my ass all the time at the beginning. But then over time, you know, you start to feel that there's changes happening, you know, like he's not questioning every single thing that I do. When I make a suggestion, he, he listens and he just goes with it. He doesn't like, he's not worried about the decision. So, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in, in, in that process that for me, were very re rewarding. Now, when I look at it now, and I, you know, at that time, it, it's it's complicated working with your father, you know. Sure. Uh, but but when I look at at it now, I, I I always say, wow, you know, thank God that I I had him to teach me all these things, uh, you know, and to force me to do things a certain way, that have helped me tremendously. Now that he's not around, and you know, for the last 20 years, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of which, you know, Padron, obviously a phenomenal brand one of the most revered cigar brands in the entire world. So if you had to say, you know, what is the Padron philosophy and what are your keys to success? Well, <clears throat> I mean, to, to um, first you have to understand the industry that we're in, right? The cigar industry is a very uh, complicated industry from the standpoint that it's a handmade product. Um, it's very dependent on a lot of factors. Um, so I would say, that the number one thing is attention to detail, right? You have to have attention to detail at every stage and you have to be able to be consistent in how you execute these things on a year out and year in and year out basis. You have to have great people because, I mean, if you don't have good people to help, there's no way that you can do what you're doing. What we do, I mean, we depend on a lot of people to put out our products out and to execute every single day based on the philosophy that's been put forth, you know? Yeah. But obviously it starts from the top, you know, and if you let things slide, then things will slide. But if you, you know, are, if you, if you lead by example and you show that, you know, you're not going to tolerate when things aren't done the right way, then everything just starts to, you know, it's like a machine. It just keeps going and people buy in. And then once people buy in, then they execute and then they demand that of their, you know, sure. people working for them, and that's kind of how it has to be. And my dad is the one that set that tone, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. And uh, you know, basically, was not willing to compromise. And and that's and that's a thing. If you're not willing to compromise and you're not willing to to give up certain things, then you'll never be able to execute with consistent quality because not every year you're going to be able to do the same things. You have to be able to either be willing to sell less or to make less or to grow less. So there's a lot of things that go into that. Yeah. You know, and speaking of family, you know, your son, Jorge Luis, and your nephew, AJ, recently jumped into the family business. You know, what's it like working with them? It's a lot of fun. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a pain in the ass sometimes because you got to be, you know, like their father and their uncle, but at the same time, their boss. And, you know, you got to be... You know, sometimes you got to call them out and stuff, but you know, and it and it's important to be able to to do that at work, but to also have the family life on the you know after and forget about that and just be able to move forward. So that's part of it's a complicated thing in a family business. Yeah. Um, 
you know, but I fortunately I had the experience with my father and that that helps me also in dealing with them and not just them because it's Jorge Luis, it's AJ, it's AJ's brother Andres, it's my other nephew Marcos, Jeffrey, Kimberly, um, you know, who am, I, who am I missing? I mean, there's, there's my daughter Daniela now is doing some part time. I mean, you know, it's it's a true family business. Exactly. Yeah. And they're all at the same, you know, their age group mm -hmm. is below me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have to kind of be like a father figure at work right. and their boss. Right. You know, in, in these things. So it's fun. Yeah. So And that's why I have all these gray hairs. <laughs> well, at least you have hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, so switching gears a little bit, you know, Nicaragua is the largest producer of premium tobacco in the cigar world as a country, right? How much has Nicaragua changed over the years since you started, you know, the first time you went there? You know, how much has it changed? What have you seen changes? I know it's a long, probably a long answer, but... Well, imagine I started going there. Well, I mean, I, from the first time I went, we won't even get into that. But when we started in 1990 again, I mean, when we went to Nicaragua, we didn't have any... We had maybe... We had one building where we had our factory. We had another property that we had to get back from the government, which we ended up getting back, which eventually became where the factory is now. But Nicaragua has grown. I mean, it is unbelievable how far we have come in Nicaragua in the last, you know, 30, 35 years. Yeah. You know, um, not just our own company, but other companies that have come in and, uh, you know, the investment, uh, you know, the agricultural side is blowing up. You know, there's farms everywhere and there's, People are growing tobacco, and it's it's a good, I mean, it's a good thing what's happening in Nicaragua, Absolutely. and the growth has been phenomenal. So the most important thing, though, is you know that we've worked hard to build the name of Nicaragua and the quality of Nicaragua, and we hope that those standards of quality are not compromised for the sake of you know excess growth. So that's the that's the important thing to keep in mind. Yeah. So as the president of Padron Cigars, obviously you wear a lot of hats. What's your favorite part of what you do? Honestly, <clears throat> my favorite part is going to Nicaragua. You know, when I'm there, it's just different. You know, you're Miami and all the sales stuff is fun. It's nice. But, you know, I already did that yeah. for all these years. And, and I, uh, you know, we, we come and we do events and those type of things. And I love to be with my friends. I have a lot of friends in the cigar business. Uh, but, you know, the, the part that's interesting is what's happening in Nicaragua or in the production side. Yeah. You know, the farming, the whole challenge of, you know, maintaining the production of the quality. You know, that, sure. that daily grind that, you, you know, you're going through every single day, that, that keeps me, like, you know, more than the selling. The cigars, fortunately, you know, they sell, you know, and we, we do well on that side. It's, the hard part is making them, you know, yeah. and that's... And, and making them consistently. So that's really like the, the part that for me is... Your favorite. My, yeah. Awesome. So, you know, Padron has an exceptional portfolio of cigars. But if you had to choose three, maybe four cigars that are must-tries, right? And maybe some of your personal favorites. What would you say about them? And tell us a little bit about what you choose, you know, the blend as far as like the character of that blend and why you choose it. You know what I mean? So give us some, some of your favorites. So, um... <clears throat> Maz, what I, with a question like that, I think it's important to understand a few things. Number one, uh, I think that our portfolio of cigars offers excellent cigars at every price point and at every level in terms of strength in the strength spectrum and complexity. Um, having said that, I think for someone who has never or who is new to cigars, I would say to start with a cigar like the Damaso, which is a cigar that has complexity but it's a milder cigar. Um, you know, for me, my personal preferences, yeah. um, I, I generally smoke more full-bodied cigars. So, you know, my cigars are the 50th anniversary is one of the ones that I think, because uh, when, I, when I smoke a cigar, contrary to a lot of things, I like to be calm when I'm smoking a cigar. I don't want to be, like if I'm playing golf, I don't get the same feel of, of the cigar if you're out there fishing if you're outside there's wind yeah like it, the cigar it doesn't taste the same to me yeah but when i'm sitting at home and having a scotch and i'm so 50th anniversary which i think is a cigar that tremendous complexity 
the 80th, mm -hmm. it's only one person that makes that cigar, as well as the 50th anniversary for that matter. So we only have one person that makes that cigar. He's the same person every day, never changes. I mean, those are cigars that are just very unique in, in the, their construction. And I think the construction also affects how the cigar smokes. And it, it to me, it just offers a lot of complexity. Yeah. And then also the last one is the 85. Yeah. I mean, I smoke a lot of, like that's what I'm smoking right now. Yeah. Um, you know, the Family Reserve 85. The Family Reserve line is a, is a line that has more stronger tobaccos inside. It has a lot of complexity. This particular size for me is easy to smoke. It doesn't require a lot of time. And you know, the shape, the size, the 50 ring gauge for me is, is one that I generally gravitate to. Yeah, same, same. So obviously all great choices. So obviously as someone who is politically active and an advocate of the tobacco industry, how do you see the future of the industry going, you know, in that realm, as far as, you know, the tobacco industry, maybe legislation, things of that matter? I think the, the future of the cigar industry is a good one. Um, I think that we have made significant inroads as, a, as, an, as, a, as an industry uh, through the CRA and, uh, you know, many of my colleagues and competitors in the industry that have that decided to put to you know to get together and to start this organization that would dedicate itself to to protecting the premium uh you know handcrafted cigars as well as our family business because most of us are in our family businesses but this is this is a battle that doesn't end ever this right. is a constant thing yeah. and uh you know we have to be prepared to continue to defend the industry because Unfortunately, there is a lot of misunderstanding as to what this industry is really all about. Uh, you know, who we sell cigars to, um, you know, how the cigars are made, what cigars they are. I mean, there's just, there. Th unfortunately, there is not a lot of clear understanding of what exactly it is that we do. So a big part of that is educating. Educating is, is a huge part of it. And that's something that um, you know, requires a lot of time yeah. and patience and dedication. And, uh, you know, there's a handful of us that are on the CRA and others that have contributed, but hopefully more people, more uh, cigar companies and family businesses will get involved and, and contribute, whether by time or money or however. But just to understand that uh, it's in the best interest of all of us to make sure that people understand clearly what and who we are. What this industry is all about who we are, who we sell to. Yeah. Um, because if we want to ensure that future generations have the same benefits and opportunities that we've had, then that better happen. And it should happen soon. Sure. Uh, sooner rather than later. Absolutely. So what is on the horizon? You look down the line. What's on the horizon for Padron Cigars? <clears throat> You know, um, without giving anything away, you know, yeah, trade no. secrets and stuff. Um, for me, I've always been pretty consistent in how I look at things in terms of looking forward. Um, my main goal has always been to maintain. Yeah. Number one. Yeah. Right. Um, maintain the quality, maintain the working environment, maintain the employees, maintain it's underestimated sometimes how important that word is. No. Everybody's always focused on growth, 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 growth. And they don't realize that that sometimes greatly affects what, how you got to where the point that you're at. Agreed. So for me, when my father died and even before that, I knew that my thing was going to be, let's keep this thing rolling. Let's make sure we don't screw any of this up and we have the right people, the right tobacco, and listen, the company has grown. Yeah. I mean, if you make, it's if you if you have that vision of maintaining, yeah, you you'll grow. grow. You'll yeah. grow. Yeah. You don't have to put the growth. You have to put the focus on the quality and this with a hammer, you know, yeah. repeating and repeating and repeating. Yeah. And you know what? Things have a way that it doesn't happen by chance. I right. mean, obviously, you're pushing. Right. You're pushing, but you're pushing with an understanding that you will only push as far as you can to, while maintaining right. what we have. And and once you feel that you're pushed too far, then you can't keep pushing. Yeah, you gotta you gotta hold up. And that's a good lesson yeah. for the for for the kids. Yeah, because you know when you graduate from college or you come in new, 
you want to conquer. You want to go, I want to sell, sell, sell. And that's good. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, you want that. Right. But you also have to, you, you can't ignore what it is that got you there. Correct. And you need to understand that part of it. Yeah. So you don't, you know, you don't do things the wrong way. Yeah. So George, I want to thank you for joining us. Listen, at the end of the day, thank you for your support. We appreciate everything you do from our family to you. Much continued success in the cigar industry. All the best to you and your family. Salud. Thank you, Anthony. And I also want to say that I want to thank Rob Olivian for having believed in us many, many years ago yeah. uh, when we were just starting and that he brought the cigars in. Uh, he knew the quality of the product, but at that time we weren't at the level that we are now. Yeah. So I always appreciate good friends. Well, salud so here's to, to Robbie Levin. Salud. Salud.